Progressive star Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had a number of key moments throughout the year. She continued to push for Medicare for All and an end to stock trading by members of Congress. Representative Ocasio-Cortez also grilled executives at banks and gun companies. She also clashed with Fed Chair Jerome Powell over his handling of record inflation. The New York Democrat easily won re-election to a third term in Congress. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman Bush, and to all of our witnesses for being here today. Um, but I just have to underscore how grateful we are, we are for Representative Bush's leadership uh, and determination in securing such a historic and unprecedented hearing, uh, not just for this committee, but for the country. So thank you. We know that private insurance is the primary health coverage for two-thirds of Americans with the majority of private insurance being employer-sponsored. But what I think most people in the US, most working class people need to contend with is the fact that money is that the money employers spend on health benefits and particularly for-profit private health insurance comes from the money that they would have otherwise spent on our wages. Dr. Collins, in 2020, the standard company-provided health insurance policy totaled over about $7,000 a year for single coverage and over $21,000 a year for family coverage. Is that correct? Yes. And with employer-sponsored insurance, your employer pays a large portion and, your, and you pay a smaller portion, correct? Yes. So in the case of individual coverage, if the total cost is around $7,400 and your employer pays, say, $6,200 and then you pay for around $1,200, now that's thousands of dollars more that everyday people could be saving per year if it weren't going directly to insurance companies' uh, private profits, correct? Yes. Interesting. <laughs> so one of the things that we're really seeing here is that the potential to moving to a Medicare for all system could actually give people a raise in many circumstances. Now a common rebuttal to that and a common rebuttal to Medicare for all that you'll hear from conservatives and the right is that we would merely just change the way in which that same premium is charged and that those same dollars would come at that, that are coming out of our paychecks now will then just be coming out in the form of taxes. But the truth is that Medicare for All actually lowers the overall cost of health care as well. Dr. Collins, isn't it true that Medicare for All would also reduce the average total costs for lower and middle income families by eliminating more medical expenses than they would pay in taxes? Depending on how and how um, how it was it was structured, um, it is there is there is that possibility, um, particularly in terms of getting provider prices down, which drive these costs um, in, that people are paying. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it you don't even have to take just our word for it. In fact, that conclusion has been confirmed via thorough research by the Center for a Responsible Federal Budget. We also know that Medicare for all is much cheaper than private insurance. Dr. Collins, public options like Medicare actually pay hospitals and service providers less than private insurance companies have to for the same service. So a single payer public option would drive down costs additionally through its ability to negotiate on health services and drug prices. Isn't that right? That's very true. And in fact, I think the evidence for that uh, isn't just theoretical, it isn't just calculated by, uh, by think tanks, but we see it in everyday life. Another case in point right here is, comes from my district. Almost everywhere in the world, health outcomes are correlated with a person's income. But one of the only places in the world that that doesn't apply is in Queens. One of the handful of zip codes where your income does not determine the quality of health care that you have. And the reason for that is our crown jewel of a public hospital, Elmhurst Hospital in Queens. Years ago, we as a community made a commitment that we would never turn anybody away based on their health insurance status, their documentation status, their housing, or their income. Every single person who enters Elmhurst Hospital gets treated regardless of their ability to afford care. And what we have found is that it's more affordable to treat everybody, it's possible to treat everybody, 
and people can get higher quality care than they ever could under our current privatized for-profit system. And with that, I yield back to the chairwoman. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joe. Thank you, Senator Merkley. Thank you to all of our House colleagues. I mean, we're all here for the same purpose. And uh, Representative Spanberger said it so well that this isn't just about actual impropriety, but this is about the perception of impropriety. Because in doing so, we're able to tackle two issues at once. One, legitimate concerns about conflict of interest, whether it is a member being able to have access to things like, uh, to, to things like you know, briefings that require security uh, clearances and being able to kind of commingle both that experience and the, the ability to trade stock. Um, not only that, but also the, the consideration of having any sort of stock while you are voting uh, on legislation before the House. But then also, we are also tackling a crisis of faith in our institutions in the United States. And that exploitation of that crisis of faith is a direct threat to our democracy, as we have seen over the last two to four years. And it is our responsibility to ensure that we eliminate, again, that perception of impropriety, because it is these perceptions that can be exploited to undermine our most sacred institutions. And so there is a very, very, very direct connection uh, between us holding ourselves to a higher standard, holding and having that include our families. And, uh, you know, and there are, there are many different proposals here, but, you know, whether it's spouses, whether it's children, whether it's senior uh, staff members who are also in the room when it comes to uh, when it comes to writing down the actual lines, we have to be able to assure uh, the American people that it's not happening here and that they don't have to worry about if they're competing with their member of Congress's stock portfolio in order to be heard. Um, so it's a pretty simple concept, and I'm just so grateful to have uh, so many colleagues of such integrity here uh, to be pushing this issue forward. So thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Green, for yielding your time. Now, I believe um, we're here today. Today is a very heavy day for so many of us across the country. Every single one of us has woken up today with less rights than we had yesterday. And pregnant people in particular are, more danger, are in more danger in the United States uh, today than we were yesterday as a result of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. I think what we're experiencing here, it's important to tell the truth of what's going on. And with so many individuals out here, I think it's important for us to also tackle this myth that this is somehow about babies or children or life. Because the same individuals who purport claim to be protecting life fight against universal health care. Do they believe in universal child care? Do they believe in life after birth? From their policy positions, I assure you, the evidence is lacking. a life that claims to be protecting the lives of children, or rather, a, a party and individuals who claim to protect the lives of children just weeks after over a dozen children died in Texas now claim to support their life, the lives of the young. Who are we protecting? Who does this protect? No one. Overturning Roe puts every single one of us in danger. And what I think many of our colleagues perhaps haven't quite, or perhaps they have fully understood, is that this also undermines the right to privacy in the United States of America. But we are here to solve this issue. 
Our job is to develop a path forward. And in that, we know that this House has passed and is willing to codify Roe. But what we also need is answers from our colleagues in the United States Senate. So to those senators who voted for these justices under the claim and the guise that this would not happen, this decision falls on them. What will they do? As they were lied to. What will they do as a consequence of this decision? Whether that be Republican or Democrat. But we cannot allow this to go on unanswered. We are talking about a court of, with the majority of justices appointed by a party that has not won a popular presidential election more than once in 30 years. Ruling against the majority of Americans. We have a Senate that is controlled by minority rule. And we have a House suffering from the impacts of gerrymandering that amplifies and undermines our democracy. We are in a very dangerous moment, not just for women, not just for LGBT communities, not just for all of us, but we are in a dangerous moment in the world because this is not just about the right to choice. This is about rule of law and democracy and who is a full person in the eyes of the law. But to all of those who are watching today's events unfold in fear, in anger, in rage, in depression, in anxiety, one thing remains steady, that we will not stop fighting until this is fixed. And I say that to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, we are not going away. We stay, we fight, we push, and we will not be silenced. With that, I yield back to the gentleman. Thank you very much. Gentleman from New York, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Chairman, for coming in uh, uh, to speak with us today. Uh, Chair Powell, in the summer of 2019, which admittedly was a different world, <laughs> um, during a, a financial services committee hearing, uh, you relayed to me that, quote, I would look at today's unemployment as well within the range of plausible estimates of what the natural rate of unemployment is. Do you recall what the unemployment rate was around that time in 2019? I want to say 3.5%. Yes, it was 3.5%. And what is the uh, current unemployment rate today? 3.6%. 3.6. Uh, you also said, quote, when unemployment went way up, you didn't see inflation go way down. So you don't see inflation reacting to unemployment the way it does because inflation seems very anchored. Again, that was at that time. Uh, Chair Powell, would you say that some, you know, uh, briefly yes or no, but would you say that some of the contributing factors to today's inflation include ongoing supply chain issues, including volatility of uh, commodity prices as a result of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, and companies also raising prices because they can? Well, I, I would say on supply side issues, for sure, those are playing an important role. And am I correct that American workers' wage, wage gains have actually trailed inflation? Um, in other words, while the cost of goods went up by 8.6% on average, wages did not increase by that much. It depends. Uh, for some uh, people to lower end of the spectrum ha actually have been getting positive real wage gains. For most of most people, though, inflation has been higher than their wage increases. So on average, we have a wage growth at about 6.1 percent. So average wages are trailing inflation. <clears throat> um, it does seem that American workers are not primarily responsible for the inflationary issues that we're seeing today. 
Um, but despite this, we are seeing some comments from individuals like former U.S. Treasury Secretary uh, Lawrence Summers earlier this year said that in order to contain inflation, the U.S. needs uh, five years of unemployment above 5 percent or one year of 10 percent uh, unemployment. Do you agree with that assessment? So I, I understand how that number can be uh, arrived at or derived, but um, I, I think there's so much uncertainty. And in particular, the, the, um, that the answer is going to depend to a significant extent on what happens on the supply side. If we, if we do get these supply side problems uh, worked out, which I think is certainly going to happen in time, then, then, uh, then, then you wouldn't see anything like that. But I, it's a highly uncertain time, and um, our, our intention, of course, is to, is to bring down inflation while keeping the labor market strong. I think it's important to, to drive home what a 10 percent sustained unemployment, unemployment would look like uh, in this country. For context, we didn't even reach 10 percent during the Great Recession. Uh, we did experience 10 percent unemployment in 1982 following the Volcker shock. Um, but in this market, to get to 10 percent unemployment, that would require about 10.5 million additional people out of work. And historically, we know that black unemployment is usually double that of white unemployment, correct? Yes, it tends to move at twice the speed, both up and down, but certainly moving up. So when the former Treasury Secretary says he wants 10 percent unemployment overall, um, he's also saying that we need black unemployment of nearly 20 percent, or implies that. Um, but Chair Powell, I do think that despite the tools that you, may or, that you don't have, Congress does have tools as well. Um, would you say that the following actions granted in the scope of Congress could be deployed to impact inflation um, using antitrust laws against companies that are raising uh, prices using their market power? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the last part. Would this action, uh, would using antitrust laws against companies that are raising their prices uh, have an, infl an sorry, impact anti on inflation? Laws? Antitrust? Antitrust laws, ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> No worries. The, the Would, acoustics in here are different. No worries. Would that have an inflationary impact? Um, it's hard to say, really. Would uh, subjecting those companies to a windfall profits tax have a potential impact on inflation? Again, I don't. I'm, I, I and would requiring say. government contractors to keep a lid on their pricing have imp uh, certain impacts on inflation? You know, there's a long history of price controls when high, inflation's been high, and it was it was not a successful one. Really, really, it comes down to getting demand and supply in alignment. And uh, if, the Ted, if the Fed's tools mostly impact demand, um, but most of those inflationary issues could be potentially impacted by supply, how high do you think the Fed would actually have to drive unemployment to actually have an impact? Well, that's, that's going to depend on a lot of things. And, um, you know, ideally, we, uh, we can raise rates. And uh, it's very important um, that we get inflation back down, particularly for people at the margins of society who are suffering the most from inflation. And, um, maybe a longer conversation with him. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. During Wednesday's House Oversight Committee hearing, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez pressed gum manufacturers about their advertising methods. She grilled Daniel Defense CEO for an advertisement that features a man with a fall knot tattoo, a symbol that one witness claims to be increasingly embraced by white supremacists. The executives claimed to be unaware their advertisements had such imagery. The representative also asked the witnesses to condemn their industry to marketing materials to domestic terror threats. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like us to just dive right into it. I have a photo that I'd like to pull up uh, for the committee and our witnesses to be able to see. Um, can we get that uh, pulled up? It's on. Okay, perfect. Uh, Mr. Daniel, you are CEO of uh, firearm manufacturer Daniel Defense. This photograph is from an advertisement uh, featured um, for your company. Do you know, I'd like to draw your attention to that red tattoo featured in your company's advertisement. Do you know what that tattoo is, Mr. Daniel? Uh, Madam Congressman, I, I, 
Congresswoman, I'm not sure this is our ad. Can okay. you show the whole ad? Is this our ad or someone else? Yes, this is your ad, ad. Uh, Mr. Daniel. This is an advertisement for your company, Daniel Defense. Why, uh, uh, why are the brand name not in not in the photo? No ma'am? worries, no worries. So this is uh, in this is featured prominently in your advertisement. That tattoo. You've indicated that you don't know what it is, but Miss Sampson, uh, as an expert in this uh, area, can you briefly tell us uh, what that tattoo is? That's a fall knot, and it's a symbol that has been increasingly embraced by white supremacists. So, uh, Mr. Daniel, you may or may not know, but your company's advertisement uh, prominently displays iconography uh, associated with white supremacist movements. Uh, I'd also, you can also find it in this other photo that I will be pu pulling up right now. Uh, right there from January 6th, you can see the fall knot right there on uh, this uh, gentleman's chest. Uh, Mr. Daniel, yes or no, or no, are you aware that your advertising department uses imagery affiliated with white supremacist movements in its marketing materials? No, ma'am, I don't okay, think no. we Reclaiming do. my time, thank you. I, I apologize, I just have to move a bit quickly to fit these questions in. Uh, Mr. Bussey, you are a former fire, reclaiming my time. Uh, Mr. Bussey, you are a former firearms executive. Uh, do you think that the use of this kind of imagery is welcomed and encouraged in marketing for the firearms industry as a former executive yourself? I don't think it's welcomed and encouraged, but I think it's looked away from. And I think that there is a aura and an approach in the industry where any single gun customer is good, no matter how detestable their views or their actions may be. And I saw dozens of examples through my career of the acceptance of or looking away from racist things. I think that's different than seeking it out, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's properly controlled or addressed. So in your experience, you believe that a lot of uh, gun manufacturers may turn a blind eye to these kinds of instances? Yes, uh, Congresswoman, that's correct. I think they've turned a blind eye because the industry has within its DNA now the, the belief that any single new gun owner is good no matter what they do or how they market. And that's why you heard earlier the representatives from Ruger and Daniel Defense, both of them who sit on the NSSF board, Thank would you. refuse to condemn the ads. Thank you, Mr. Bussey. And uh, the toxic marketing does do enormous harm. We've seen the results with uh, white supremacists using these weapons to target and kill black Americans shopping for groceries in Buffalo, attending church in Charleston, targeting Jewish communities in Tree of Life. Uh, uh, and Mr. Daniel, once again, as the CEO of Daniel Defense, yes or no, do you believe that members of identified extremist hate groups such as the Proud Boys or Oath Keepers should be able to purchase uh, the AR-15 style rifles that your company sells? Congresswoman, we're, we're regulated by the, the um, ATF mm -hmm. through laws which you pass. We, we are very good at only... Thank you. Um, I, I apologize. I just have a, a limited amount of time. Uh, thank you. Uh, turning it to you, Mr. Kiloy, you are a board member, a CEO of uh, Sturm Ruger & Company. You're a board member of the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Mr. Daniel, you are also a board member of the NSSF. Mr. Kiloy, Palmetto State Armory is a firearms company that's a member of the NSSF. Now, I'd like to pull up another photo. Um, as a member of the foundation that you're in, right here, uh, Palmetto State Armory has used imagery clearly designed to appeal to the FBI-identified far-right domestic terror threat, Boogaloo Boys, with products such as this AK-47 style pistol designed in the same floral pattern that is often used by these uh, group members to, to identify one another. Mr. Kiloy, as a board member of the NSSF, do you condemn marketing firearms to identified extremist groups such as the Proud Boys or Oath Keepers or Boogaloo Boys? Yes or no, do you condemn your industry explicitly marketing materials to domestic terror threats? Congresswoman, the, the National Shooting Sports Foundation does not control individual member companies. But this is a member of your ad, foundation, Mr. Kiloy. To the, I, but I, I take exception to the fact that, uh, you know, I can assure you there is, uh, we do not tolerate racism or white supremacy. Do you supremacy condemn marketing these ever. materials? Okay. Do you condemn the marketing general, these materials the to Proud Boys 
Oath Keepers, or Boogaloo Boys? That's all, Madam Chair. It's just a yes or no. I, I, I didn't know that that was, I had never seen that ad before, and I didn't realize that's what it was tied to. And uh, that's, I'm not an expert in that field. So you, not yeah, we don't have expired. an answer here. The lady's time has expired. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Chair. And I, I unfortunately, um, I wish I could use all my time on questioning, but I wanted to address uh, Ms. Salter directly. I just want you to know that um, in the four years that I've sat on this committee, I have never seen members of Congress, Republican or Democrat, disrespect a witness in the way that I have seen them disrespect you today. I do not care what party they are in, I've never seen anything like that. And for the gentleman of Louisiana and the comfort that he felt in yelling at you like that, there's more than one way to get a point across. And um, frankly, men who treat women like that in public, I fear how they treat them in private. We can be better than this. We don't have to resort to yelling. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all of our uh, witnesses who are here testifying today. Um, I want to dive a little bit into uh, the Paycheck Protection Program and a bit of uh, what we've seen afterwards. I have. Uh, one of uh, three reports here that I'd like to present today, a Forbes report um, detailing uh, some of the revenues that banks have made um, during the Paycheck Protection Program, um, and also digging into a little bit of the fact that when it comes to loan forgiveness, Small Business Administration uh, recently attempted to, or recently opened a portal for small business owners to appeal directly with them for forgiveness. Um, Chase Bank of America and PNC have opted out of that direct program. Is that correct, Mr. Demchik, Mr. Diamond, and um, Mr. Moynihan? I believe so. Yeah, I'm not aware of it. I'm not, a, I'm not aware of the answer. Okay, so um, for your awareness, uh, your banks have opted out of Paycheck Protection Program forgiveness, um, and uh, Excuse me, that, that, that is incorrect. It, with, with, the, with the portal, with the SBA. Thank you. I was trying to finish my sentence. Um, now, I would like to uh, zero in a little bit on Bank of America. Mr. Moynihan, are you aware of how many PPP loans uh, your bank has facilitated on behalf of its customers? About uh, 400, and almost 500,000, and 95% are forgiven or repaid already. Mm -hmm. And we're finishing uh, up the rest of them. How, how many of those loans, uh, in terms of the percentage, have those loans been forgiven in full, as opposed to in part? The ones that are forgiven are mostly, vast, vast majority be forgiven in full. full. In full. Um, what we're starting to see here with some reporting in The Intercept, and this is just one reason why I was curious about the numbers, um, is that we're starting to see that uh, Bank of America is refusing to forgive some PPP loans in full, um, but in terms of the portal that Bank of America has set up, it's very difficult to appeal these decisions. And in fact, what we're seeing is that uh, Bank of America had pre-populated um, a forgiveness amount in their portal, sometimes drastically lower than, um, than small business owners had anticipated and had qualified for. And in instances where these small business owners have documentation, um, there's very little recourse or appeal. Uh, does your portal make it easy to appeal their decisions so that after two attempts, the SBA can then take over the case? Borrowers can appeal. 95% of the loans are forgiven repaid today, so we're only talking about 5% of the loans and a substantial part of those are going through the appeal process as we speak. And so the bars can appeal, and we're in the process of finishing up that last 20,000 or so loans. It's a, it's, it's, it's a small amount of loans, and they're finishing And the to process. certify that that 95% is a full forgiveness amount percent? Forgiveness or repayment. Some of them, full forgiveness, yeah. not partial. It, uh, the vast majority are full forgiveness, but I can get the data to you. 
So is the 90, I apologize, not to you know belabor the point, but is that 95% a partial loan forgiveness or a full loan forgiveness rate? They're getting what the, the borrowers are applying for the forgiveness entitled on the program. 95% of them have gone through or repaid, and the vast majority of them are full forgiveness, but they're entitled to what the program designed. The government designed a program, and we implemented the program very short notice. Mm -hmm. A half million people, 10,000 people working on this program. Mm -hmm. And, um, Easter weekend working on the program to help those borrowers at the time. Mm -hmm. And so we're finishing that up. It, it's, it's just let the process go. And a lot of what you're reading, frankly, is not the facts because it's old. It doesn't understand how the, how the math mm -hmm. works. And so just give us some time. We'll give you the facts and you'll see it. Yeah, it's all so in the what, um, what is the reason that Bank of America chose to opt out of the SBA portal? I can get somebody to give you that. I have no idea of... of whether I told you before, I'm not sure we did or didn't, and I have no idea why they would have made the decision, but we are processing loans as fast as anybody. Okay, and um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just uh, having a, a tough time. The, this is about $25.2 billion in loan amounts in your bank, correct? And Not anymore. No, it's down But at, at one point in time. And so we are looking, and so we're, you're uncertain as to why the bank has not chosen to uh, enroll in the SBA portal? I, I said we will get you the information. The, the amount of loans we have down left on this thing is a, a billion or so. It's down to a very little amount. No you know, worries. The, it's all paid back. It's all through. The team did a great job, and we're happy to supply the information to you. Need. All right. We look forward to it. Thank you very much.